So now we can be in recording now. Mom Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Shanti Namane Namaste Sarashwati Deve Gauravani Pachari Nene Vise Sasuni Vare Pachati Das Trayam Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nitananda Shadrita Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Govinda Govind, Ram Ram Hari Hari. Okay. So, if you've listened to my classes, you've you've heard stories that I told about Prabhupada's connection with his spiritual master, about Prabhupada always feeling connected to his spiritual master. And Prabhupada saying, I always felt he was with me. I never felt separated and so forth. So, um, yesterday I got a message that said, you need to write your Vyas Puja offering for Srila Prabhupada because the deadline is like in five days. And usually they get three, four, five hundred offerings. They allow disciples from around the world, Prabhupada disciples to offer. And at this point, they've only had 50 offerings and so everybody sends their offering on like the last day. You know how that works, right? Pay your taxes on the last day. Send your offering in on the last day. When we have retreats, they go, only 30 people have registered. I go, well, 50 will register the day before. And then some even register that day. So um, anyway, so I was up early this morning or last night, I, I said, well, you should write your offering in the morning, and I'm traveling today, which means uh, total travel time, if you count driving to the airport and hanging around, is going to be like 15, 16, 17 hours. So I thought, well, let me, this morning I'll write my offering. And then, you know, I finished the offering, chanted a little bit. More time to chant on the way. So uh, I want to tell you what came out of the offering. I had no idea what I was going to write, um, but normally what comes out is obviously what's on my mind. And and so what's been on my mind lately is, I mean, this has been on my mind a lot, but maybe specifically lately it's been on my mind more of how um, Prabhupada was so... observant, I don't know if observant is the right word, but Prabhupada was observant of his spiritual master's desire. Like he, he didn't, it, if the spiritual master indicated something by words or by actions, Prabhupada would notice it. It never got by him. Not that, oh, I didn't know you wanted that. I had no idea. No, not like that. The opposite of that. It was the total opposite of that. I was fooling around this morning with, um, I'm going to show you something as a special treat for all who came early. I was fooling around with uh, virtual backgrounds. This, this came up on my computer, choose a virtual background. I didn't, ended up finding a picture of me playing Redunga when Prabhupada came to the airport. So right there, that's me. Can you see it? That's me at the age of maybe 20. Should I go over there? You see? Yeah. Should I get out of the way? There's Prabhupada. I have to move out of the way. That is Prabhupada over there coming in. Yeah. Have any of you seen this before? It's kind of a nice. Sometimes devotees, sometimes devotees find, they find pictures and they send them to me and it just comes up like pictures I've never seen. This is one of them. 
So, yeah. Anyway, that's me right there. You might say, it doesn't look like you. Well, check out how you're going to look in 50 years. Probably a little different. So, uh, anyway, so as I was saying, could you see that background? Did you see my picture there? Yeah. Oh, my daughter, she works part-time at, um, at Krishna.com. And one of her jobs is to go through old film of still photos. And then every few days she says, oh, here's a picture of you I found. And I think we posted one couple pictures there from, the, from about 30 years ago. Anyway, so I've... I've always been, it's always been um, important to me, or I don't know what the word is, important, significant. It's been significant that, that how I would notice things that Prabhupada noticed about Bhakti Siddhanta, and then he would, that would become part of his life's well, how should we say it? Be, no, I don't want to say his mission, but it would become part of who he became. In other words, it would become, if it was Bhakti Siddhanta's desire, if he saw this was Bhakti Siddhanta's desire, then that would become his desire. As if it, just as if you and I had a desire, a very strong desire that is very foundational to who we are. You know, I'm an artist, or I'm a writer, and I, I paint, I write or whatever it is, I love to paint, I love to write. I'm a businessman, I love to start businesses. So, so that way, Prabhupada's desire, excuse me, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta's desire, was just like that for Prabhupada. If it was his desire, Bhakti Siddhanta's desire, it was Prabhupada's desire, just as if it was his own desire. Like, like he, he wasn't choosing his own desires, so to speak, but not that he didn't have desires and not you know we can't say he was uh, he was without desire but he his you know he had specific ways you know he wanted to, to preach in certain ways so that's the broader desire of bhakti siddhanta but specific things that bhakti siddhanta wanted they became his so one which one was book distribution i think that's obvious and in the offering, I cited the example. You may have heard the story. It's quite famous. And it's important to recognize. The story of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta telling Prabhupada, I think it would be better to sell the temple, the marble of the temple. It was a new temple they built. And we should use that to print books. So... There was a lecture Prabhupada gave in Los Angeles. I, I believe I must have been there. It, it's, you may have seen it. It, come, it comes up in different footage of Prabhupada. And in that lecture, Prabhupada is saying, distribute book, distribute book, distribute book. How many of you have heard that lecture? You raise your hand if you've heard it. Just you know, saying it three times. In, it is said, at least from the Vedic perspective or Indian perspective, if you want to make a point, you say it three times. I guess we could say that is, I guess it's true in general, but specifically this number three, if I say something, like Janani Vas told the story, he said, Prabhupada told him three times, you should get help in Mayapur to worship the deities. He was worshiping the deities by himself. And the Prabhupada told him three times, like over, over a span of, I don't know, 20 minutes, Prabhupada told him three times. Get help to worship the deity. So if you get help, it's important. Uh, excuse me, if you get excuse me, if you say it three times, it's important. So in this lecture, Prabhupada said, I am stressing on book distribution, distribute book, distribute book, distribute book. And then he explained why. And this is interesting, and I think it's extremely important. I mean, we know why, but I want to like help us know why maybe in, on a deeper level or make it more significant for you. So Prabhupada said, 
that his Guru Maharaj told him personally, I think it would be better we sell the marble of this temple because the devotees are fighting about which room they want to stay in. And we take that money and we distribute books. So when Prabhupada heard that, he said, oh, oh, I noted books, how important books are, you know. So, um, yeah. So, you know, now let's put yourself, put yourself in that situation. This would be like a little experiment. We call, some people call it a mind experiment. So you're, you're in that group and you overhear Srila Bhakti Siddhanta saying, you know, because the devotees are fighting, I think it would be better we sell the marble and print books. Now, you might hear that and, you know, your day goes on as normal and nothing happens. It's possible, right? Oh, uh, Guru Maharaj said, you know, he thought he should sell the marble and print books. That, you know, and it's like, it's an interesting idea or a cute idea or a novel idea. And you might think, well, he doesn't really mean that. He's just upset that the devotees are fighting and, you know, but just if we just go on the street and distribute books, we won't fight and everything will be good. It's not the way Prabhupada heard it, of course. But you understand my point. You could hear that and and it wouldn't affect you at all. You wouldn't you wouldn't think anything special. So Prabhupada said when he heard heard that, I noted, this is Prabhupada's words, I noted, I noted his keen desire to distribute books. That's what Prabhupada noted from that. And, and as we know, Prabhupada stresses book distribution, right? But we should understand it's not Prabhupada stressing book distribution. It's Srila Bhakti Siddhanta stressing book distribution and Prabhupada stressing what Srila Bhakti Siddhanta wants. But because, as I said, Prabhupada's desires are equal with Bhakti Siddhanta's desires, you can't tell the difference. So you could say, Prabhupada is always stressing book distribution. And that because it is his desire, but it's his desire because it's his spiritual master's desire. And, and I can guarantee you, if if Srila Bhakti Siddhanta stressed making movies, Prabhupada would have said, make movies, make movies, make movies. Of course, of course, now you know with the internet and like that, you it's um we can't always say exactly what Prabhupada would say, but um we definitely know he did say many things about book distribution. And maybe in the future books will won't even be paper, they'll have some different form. Who knows? They'll be virtual and you go like bing, 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 and the books appear and and they're made out of who knows what, you know, subtle energy, you know, but it'll it'll be considered a book of some sort. So we use that as a reference point. Um, so Prabhupada saying distribute books, distribute books, distribute books. Yeah, it's done. Oh, oh yeah, one second. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so, um, so we see, we see that um, Prabhupada's desire, which looks like his desire, is actually Bhakti Siddhanta's desire, right? And it just looks like his. So if you see Prabhupada stressing something, you can pretty much know that's what his Guru Maharaj stressed. And, and like we have, I don't know if you know this, but in, um, it must have been 1972, 
Prabhupada sent his disciples to India to learn the art of doll making. You know, in India, how they make uh, they make deities and dolls out of straw and clay, I believe, or straw and mud. I mean, if you're Indian, you know, because whenever there's Durga Puja, they make some deity out of straw and mud, and then when the puja is over, they just throw it in the Ganga or they throw it wherever. Or sometimes you'll see in India, there'll be some deity sitting like by a tree that was used for a festival and then it's just like it just sits there and it's neglected so those those are usually made of doll and mud doll uh, straw and mud straw and clay so Prabhupada, the reason he sent the devotees there is because he his spiritual master used to have an exhibition it's called these were called dioramas you know you had different models of i'm not sure what the dioramas were maybe somebody knows but it could have been Leela, it could have been philosophical. What what the devotees did, I don't I don't know specifically if Prabhupada approved everything the devotees did before they did it, but the devotees made dioramas both of Leela and philosophy, like you know, bird in the cage, you know, the diorama of a lady polishing a cage, or we had the changing bodies diorama. Um, in Los Angeles, they have the universal form. They made a diorama of that. They have models of Prabhupada in Vrindavan. They have uh, a model of, of it shows a, a, an elephant, a, a dog, and a man with a light in it. And it shows a sannyasi. And it says, it quotes the Gita, the Pandita Samadarshana. He sees equally the, the dog, the dog eater, and the elephant. Suni Chaivas. Suni Chaiva Sapakecha, Pandita Samadarshan, Suni Chaiva Sapakecha. Yeah, so like that. So Bhakti Siddhanta used to have dioramas, these big exhibits, and they would travel from town to town. And I, I got the impression that it was just like set it up in the middle of town. But they had, I think, amusement park there also, like to attract people and other things that weren't directly Krishna conscious. But so, at one point, Prabhupada said, I want these diorama exhibits in all the temples. And so now I just want you to like, like put yourself back into 1972. The Hare Krishna movement is basically five years old, five or six years old. There's maybe a thousand, I don't know, thousand devotees, 1500. And there's maybe... 40 temples, 30 temples, right? So it's not a very big movement. And basically all that's been going on is deity worship, Hari Nam, and book distribution, and some, some little college preaching. But not like big congregational preaching and opening of so many temples and Kartiks and Vrindavan and, you know, all these big John Mastamis, like none of that. So... It's a very simple movement. There's not much going on. And then Prabhupada says, we want dioramas in every temple. And it's like out of the blue, like dioramas? What for? Why? You know, where did that idea come from? And now you know where the idea came from. It, it never happened that there were dioramas in every temple. But in Mayapur, you'll see there's dioramas all around. Well, they're two-dimensional. Um, they're all around Prabhupada's Samadhi. Um, but anyway, they may have had diorama exhibitions in the old days of my professor, so I can't remember. But in the Detroit Temple, Detroit, Michigan, in, in the United States, and in Los Angeles, California, in the United States, there are ex uh, diorama exhibitions done under Prabhupada's order. And I guess the funding, uh, the necessary funding to keep that group of devotees alive and working wasn't there so that they disbanded that project after Prabhupada left. But you see my point, Prabhupada saying dioramas is not just oh, some idea coming out of his head. No, this is Bhakti Siddhanta's idea. Now, I think I mentioned this on the class that we gave to Russian devotees, this next, next example. But this is an amazing example, and I'm going to mention it here. 
And um, please share this example because this example is extremely powerful. And I think, I think this example has slipped the minds of many devotees. I don't realize, they may not realize this, but in that class on Friday, for those of you who are there, who were awake and listening and whose memory still functions, you remember that I told that Prabhupada encouraged his god brothers to work with him and he encouraged one specific god brother that he had big disagreements with who who, who even said that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta kind of rejected that god brother. You know, it was it was like it wasn't it wasn't just a little disagreement. It was like this was big, you know. The you know, even Bhakti Siddhanta lost hope or faith in that god brother and some god brothers were trying to take credit for Prabhupada's success saying oh we sent him to America we are the real acharyas do you know that are you aware of this you know we are the real acharyas we are the jaga gurus we send him some were trying to say Prabhupada was successful, not because he was Shaktivesh empowered, but he was a good businessman. Hare Krishna. Hold on a second. I think I need to change my internet settings. Okay. was connected to my house. So this will be better. The internet connection is like yoga, you know, yoga means connection. So we all have a connection with Krishna. Some, some, of, some of the connection is weak. Some have a high, a powerful signal. Some are on 5G. Some of, some of us are still on 1G. Very weak, outdated signal. So, what I'm saying is that there were some huge disagreements, like huge differences, like, like foundational differences. And Prabhupada talks about these differences in his books. They wanted one acharya. Bhakti Siddhanta said, no, there's not going to be one acharya. Prabhupada said, if he wanted one acharya, he would have said it. He didn't say it. So this was a big thing. Like this is this is what split the Gaudiya Mat. This was a very big controversy right kind of like in iskan you have ritvik those who think only Prabhupada's the guru and those and those who say no Prabhupada's disciples he wants them to be guru or you have what else do we have in iskan yeah we, we, but the, this is like this is like foundational controversy this is huge whether you fell from brahman or vaikuntha that's not such a big thing because Wherever you fell from, you're here, and you have the process to go back to Godhead. So, you know, we can disagree on that and still share prasadam together. It's not a big thing. But when you disagree on fundamentals of how to spread Krishna consciousness or, you know, deep fundamentals of Siddhanta, but especially how your Guru Maharaj wanted to spread Krishna consciousness, that's a big disagreement. So, you know, he wanted an acharya. No, he didn't want acharya. Yes, we should appoint acharya. No, he didn't say any acharya. If he wanted acharya, he would have said it. Did he forget in his last days? He forgot something after you know so many years of preaching. This one thing he forgot, and everything else he told us. No, he he told us work conjointly. GBC mm -hmm. acharyas are acharyas are um, self effulgent. You can't appoint them. So this Prabhupada's disagreeing, having disagreements over this, and Prabhupada saying this is what broke up the Gaudiya Math, because they disobeyed the order of the spiritual master and became useless. Now, listen to what I have to say. That's a pretty big disagreement, right? And and could you imagine, right? You're you are dealing with another devotee who's saying something that diametrically opposes what Srila Prabhupada said. How does that make you feel? You know, like, I don't want to see him. I don't want to talk to him. How can he think this way? What is wrong with him? We just, et cetera, et cetera. This is where 
the mind goes, but where does the heart go? The heart is enraged. You know, we like to like to take that person and brainwash them. Say, I have to sit down and put these electrodes on your head. I'm gonna like, you know, knock some sense into your head. This is what you're saying is destructive. It's destroying the whole whole, you know, someone saying something that was destroying Iskan, how would you feel about that person? You'd be very, very angry, very upset. These are the people that Prabhupada is asking, come work with me and spread, we will spread Krishna consciousness around the world. Have you ever thought of that before? Because that is so amazing. And why? Why? Because Prabhupada said that his spiritual master wanted him to encourage his god brothers, number one. He wanted them to encourage his god brothers. Number two, he wanted, Prabhupada knew, Bhakti Siddhanta wanted them to work conjointly, cooperatively to spread Krishna consciousness around the world. So, so just as the desire to distribute books or the desire for dioramas was Bhakti Siddhanta's desire that became Prabhupada's desire, this also it was Prabhupada's desire because it was Bhakti Siddhanta's desire. Now, if this were not Bhakti Siddhanta's desire, do you think Prabhupada would have put himself through all that stress and anxiety to try to work with people that he felt were actually offending his guru and were jealous of him? Probably not. Like, why, why would you? Yeah, I can't say he wouldn't, but I, but it seems like maybe it's not likely because his movement was already successful and he didn't need them. But now he's calling them, come preach, let's work together. That's the desire of Bhakti Siddhanta. That's what he wanted. That desire is in Prabhupada's heart, even to the point where he's willing to overlook such huge disagreements and say, let's, let's not worry about this. Let's conjointly spread Krishna consciousness. That is amazing. And we all know how much Prabhupada wanted us to work together. So <clears throat> this is something that can inspire us when we have difficulty working with other devotees, thinking, well, Prabhupada was willing to do that with his god brothers, so I should be willing to do it also, at least the best I can. I mean, obviously, Prabhupada is transcendental. So he can transcend any kind of feelings that might come up that these God brothers have failed or even in some sense cheated or tried to grasp the property of their guru and so on. He can overlook all that. He's transcendental. It may be extremely difficult for us to do it, but at least we have this example, right? So how does this all play into separation? Well, Back to back, I want to go back to the original statement. My original state, misstatement was that Prabhupada always felt his spiritual master with him. So, as I was writing this morning, it became more clear what this means. And you may already understand this, and I may have already explained this, but sometimes we get realizations we forget and then we again realize. And, if the desire of your guru is the only thing in your heart, then naturally you would say, I always feel I'm with my guru, right? That's how I'm with him, through his desire. Does that make sense to you? How can, you know, how can we be with our guru all the time? Well, if your desire, if his desire is your desire, then his desire is what's in your heart, therefore he's always in your heart, right? Now, <clears throat> there's, an, there's another a nuanced way of looking at that, slightly different way, same thing, but different. We say that Prabhupada was empowered, an empowered preacher. So empowered means you get some power. So, but now, well, whose power did he get? He got the power of his guru. But how do you get the power of your guru? Well. Look at it this way. You're loading a suitcase and the suitcase is full. And you ever have a full suitcase and you're trying to squeeze something more into it and you can't, you squeeze it in, but you can't close it. There's really no room for it. And you maybe 
but you might break your suitcase if you try to close it. I I travel very, no, I don't travel so light, but I try to travel light. And I have like all kinds of space in my suitcase. And when I come back from traveling, it's filled up with things people give me. You know, here, take this, take this, take this, you know. So a lot of times I can't take everything because there's no room. I, won't, I can't close my suitcase or it weighs too much. So if, if you're going to be empowered, in this example, the empowerment can only work if you take everything out of your suitcase. The empowerment is so big, so grand, that you have to remove everything for it to fit in the suitcase and for it to work. If there's anything else in there, then the empowerment is minimized. So you won't be very effective. I don't know um, if that's a good example. But yeah, it, 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 I think you, you, you look, let's say, let's say you have a plate. How much can I serve you? Well, it depends on how much room is left on your plate, right? I want to serve you something. You have other things that you like, but it's not what I want to give you, but I can't give it to you because your plate's full. So in order, so if what I want to serve you is the empowerment, so Srila Bhakti Siddhanta wants to serve Prabhupada, the empowerment to successfully spread Krishna consciousness, he's got to wash his plate, and then he has a plate full of empowerment. So if we want to be empowered, then we have to clean our plate so that our guru, so that Srila Prabhupada can give us the empowerment. Otherwise, there's no room for it. The, it otherwise, it's full of our own desire. And so with our own desire, unless that desire is Krishna's desire, but in this example, we would say, it's my own personal desire, it's not Krishna's desire. So unless I clear that plate, then there's no room for the empowerment. And so the more that plate is clear, the more subji you can put on. And if that subji or if that prasadam is considered empowerment, then when the plate is fully cleaned, you can fill it up with empowerment and that's enough empowerment to spread Christian consciousness around the world. Now, is that clear? Is that example okay for you? Yeah. Okay, so now here's another example. Another th something that Prabhupada said, which explains this example. It's like tying these things together. Prabhupada said, uh, I have no qualification. It's all my Guru Maharaj's qualification, right? So that, in this example, would be that would be saying, I have no subji. It's all my Guru Maharaj's subji. There's no subji on my plate. I clean my plate. I don't, I don't have any empowerment. All I have is material desire. <laughs> I don't have any empowerment. I get rid of my material desire. My plate is clean. My success... I am not successful. My success is my Guru Maharaj's success because it's him. It's him empowering me. And that's what it means to be an empowered Shakti Vishavatar, to be empowered to spread Krishna consciousness. It means, it means that my Guru Maharaj is saying, go this way, and I actually let him just push me. But if I'm not empowered, my Guru Maharaj says, go this way, and I say, but can I go this way? Or can I go this way? Or can I go this? There's a resistance there, right? Like if you're trying to pull an animal in a, person, a specific direction and the animal's resisting, you're pulling. As opposed to you just tap it with a stick and it goes. So the disciple is like that. It gets tapped by the stick and then they go. That's empowerment. That's how they become empowerment. But if they get tapped by the stick and they, they start kicking and they stand there you're trying to push the bull or it won't move or it's making noises. So, so that's that's why we don't get empowered. So, so now this is this is um a beautiful idea that you and I, all of us, it's not about what we can do, it's about what we can open up to let Prabhupada do. So it's not, I'm not that smart. I'm not that Krishna conscious, I'm not that whatever. That's not that's not the point, and that's not what Prabhupada's saying. Prabhupada's saying is all you have to do is just when I tap, you go. And then I will make sure I will push you. So you don't even need the strength, 
You just have to be willing to let me push you and then you will go. So when we say Prabhupada's empowered by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, that means there is no resistance there. So the empowerment fully comes. So this is such a good example for us. You know, all of us think, well, I'm helpless, I'm useless, I can't do anything. But that's okay. I mean, actually, that's the right way to think. If you, if you think of it in the proper way, that helplessness, I can't do anything, is the proper attitude. Because then you take everything off your plate and you're totally dependent on, on Guru and Krishna. So Guru Maharaj, come and push me. I can't, I, I, I'm ready, I'm ready. Everything's off my plate. I won't, I won't resist your direction. Then your Guru can push you. That, that's, that's what it means to be empowered. And that's why Prabhupada would, would say things like, I have no qualification. I haven't done anything. Well, no, but Prabhupada, you spread Krishna consciousness around the world. No, I haven't done anything. That, that what you, what, you know, it's like, yeah, let's give another example. Maybe this other example is better. You have the body of a car, but no engine. So depending on the engine you put in, that will determine the speed of the car. So you put this amazing engine in the car and then you get in and drive the car and the car drives like a race car. So <clears throat> the car body says, it has nothing to do with me. It has all to do with the engine. I'm just a car body. I'm, I'm just allowing this engine to push me. I, my brakes are off. I have a transmission. So it allows this engine to push me, but it's all the engine. So that means any car body that can hold an engine, the bigger the engine, the faster that body will go. So it's not about the car body. It's about the engine. So we all have potentially this engine, this transcendental engine that can push us to very high levels of Krishna consciousness. And we're thinking, I can't be Krishna conscious. That's okay if you understand that in your can't, your, your can't means that I can't do it on my own, but I can do it by the empowerment. That's important. Don't just say I can't do it and then give up or think you'll never make it, but I can't do it on my own. I can do it by the empowerment. And I have a story that I heard last night. This is, this is from a devotee who had, had who was a disciple of Hari Kesh Prabhu. And Hari Kesh uh, formerly was a Swami. And then he gave up his service as guru. So it was, this devotee was feeling kind of lost after that. And he was, pre, he was pretty desperate. And you could say probably, probably quite depressed from, from what the story sounds like. Desperate and depressed. And, and hopeless also. He said, I lost my guru. What to do? And he was praying to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, please help me. Please help me. Please help me. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. Please help me. Please help me. And then he had a he then he, you know, he was he was, yeah, he was des he was fearful that he couldn't go on in Krishna consciousness, perhaps somewhat desperate out of fear that maybe I won't be successful. Uh, and confused, how? How will I be successful? I don't have a guru. I lost my guru. And Prabhupada came into a dream and he said, don't worry. I am here to help you. You have nothing to worry about. Isn't that beautiful? He's not a disciple of Prabhupada, but Prabhupada came to him to encourage him that it's not you that's going to become Krishna conscious. It's the empowerment. It's the kripa. It's the mercy. It's an, and I am here. I am here to help you become Krishna conscious. So that's, that's very important. So this is what Prabhupada was teaching us. And the, the point of this talk so far is just, I was noticing how much Prabhupada was noticing the desires of Bhakti Siddhanta. And that's what it means to be empowered, to notice those desires and make those desires your desires. And then that 
then then now you're acting you have the engine of your guru you have the engine of Srila Prabhupada in you and that engine is you just have to embody you have a body and now this body can move and act in so many ways as an instrument and so at one time Prabhupada gave a lecture and he said I was at the lecture and he, he was kind of making the point that like we're all indispensable. It's not that Lord Chaitanya needs any of us. So don't ever think, well, you know, I have so much service, Krishna needs me if I, you know, if I don't cook the offering, no one will cook it. And if you don't cook it, someone will cook it. If you don't distribute the books, you know, it's not that books won't be distributed. And one time a devotee told a story that he was sleeping after lunch and Prabhupada said, you, you know, you don't have to, the movement doesn't need you if you're just going to sleep, you know. So we're, we're not indispensable. So Prabhupada said, whether you stay in this movement or not, Lord Chaitanya predicted that it would spread. So so it's really it's really, so Prabhupada said, it's really a question of, of who's going to do it. And obviously those who stay will do it. Those who go, they can't do it because Krishna can't use them. So Prabhupada was making that point. It's not really so much our qualification, but how much we're willing to be used. So, you know, we want to spread Krishna consciousness. You, you want to make your countries Krishna conscious. We have Croatia here. We have Russia here. We have... We have Norway or now Lithuania, Norway here. We have India, soon to be Toronto here, Mexico, India, Russia, Russia, Mauritius, Chile, Austria, India, America, and Sweden, Scarlet's in Sweden, Delaware, United States, Pune. They have so many places that you, if you want to make those places Krishna conscious, then if you think, I cannot do it, I'm not qualified, that's good. But as we've discussed, especially in the self-care course, any kind of thinking can be uplifting or degrading. So the thought that I can't do it could be very degrading and it could be very uplifting, right? You ever feel I can't do it and you don't do anything because you become discouraged because you're thinking it's all dependent on you. But to think I can't do it, if thought in the right way is good, it's the proper way of thinking. And now I, I can't do it. But as Prabhupada said, if you stay, then Lord Chaitanya can use you to do what he wants done. It's, it's kind of like he's using us in spite of our disqualifications. Because we're not kicking and fighting, we're willing to be used. Okay, Krishna, I'll, I'll like I, I, you want me to do this? I don't know how to do this, but I'll try. Um, it's your desire. I will make that my desire. Another another thing we saw about Prabhupada was Prabhupada had had. His, it seemed like his compassion had no limitation. He would like go anywhere and practically do anything give people Krishna consciousness. Have you noticed that? Like make these huge sacrifices and, and not complain. When his body was starting to break down, that sometimes he, I wouldn't call that complaining. It was just in, information that this is not healthy. But we never saw Prabhupada complain. He had a lot he could complain about. Some people have nothing to complain about and all they do is complain. Prabhupada had everything to complain about and he didn't complain about anything. Except sometimes complain about us as being stupid, but you know, we are stupid. So that's just an objective, an objective statement. So um so what was my point? What was the point about? I completely forgot complaining about why did I say Prabhupada didn't complain? What was the point before that? I lost track. Does anyone remember? That he was traveling um, 
and when he started to break down, he stopped traveling. Yeah, wasn't he? He wouldn't complain, um, because oh yeah, it was because his compassion, his compassion was so, so deep that, that he I could say deep within him, and then he wanted to spread that to everyone, so much. Right? Did you notice that? Like, that's the compassion his Guru Maharaj had, right? Spread Krishna consciousness. His Guru Maharaj wasn't thinking only of India, he was thinking of the world. So Prabhupada, you know, that, that's, that's, I would say there's two things. That's that he picks up as the desire of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, but also because of you know, his pure devotion, that that's naturally a quality of pure devotion. So then, um, so I think the point I was making is if you're, if your compassion is great enough that you want to do something great and you're willing to do something great and you're willing to recognize that great things can only come when you make Krishna's desire your desire without false ego and you recognize that your body has no engine, the engine, the empowerment is going to come. And if you ever think that engine is yours, that's called false ego, then you're, you're finished. You can't do anything. But if you understand, Guru Maharaj, give me this engine. I want to do something. I want to do what you want. Give me this engine. Then, then all of us can do, can do things far beyond our material capabilities. Because as Prabhupada said, if you stay, Mahaprabhu can use you to do something. So you may be all thinking, well, what can I do? I'm just a stupid woman from this country. I'm a stupid man from this country. I'm a failure. I've never done anything great. But the fact is, many great things have been done in the Krishna consciousness movement by ordinary people who become became extraordinary because a new engine was put in them. They weren't using their old engine, which is what they could do, but they got a new engine, which was a race car engine. So this, this whole talk was to come around to the point of how Prabhupada would say, I'm always with my guru. So when, when you're that close to the, the desire of your guru, when your desire is his desire, when your existence is his existence, then how could you ever feel separation even after he leaves? And if we don't feel that way when he was alive, even if you're next to him, you'll feel distant, right? So, you know, we think, oh, if I'm close, I'll, if I'm close, I'll be close. Not necessarily. You may be, you may not be. Or you may have the opportunity by that association to be close or to make advancement, but you may not be able to take advantage of it. It's possible. And even at a distance, if you make your desire his desire, then that empowerment will come to you. And you'll feel that that closeness. And that's and that's also why we say that even though you never met Prabhupada, you can feel very close to him. Through executing his mission, trying to understand what he wants. Now I think that should be clear, right? And this is this series on separation was was um, inaugurated, I believe, if I remember correctly, because of uh, we were pre preparing for the departure of Kadamba Khanan Marsh, or maybe it happened after his departure. I think it happened before his departure, right? Yeah. So we were preparing for that, and some devotees were asking if you could speak about separation, like how how we can deal with this. And so I think this class is very important for that to understand. And if if I execute the instructions of my spiritual master, naturally I think of him. If I don't execute those instructions, then I'm I'm not I'm it's really difficult to be connected to someone who you don't follow. Right? You know, let's say your father leaves, he gives you a business he gives you the responsibility for the, for the family. And if you execute the business and the family responsibilities, you will feel close. 
But if you neglect those responsibilities, you just you'll have you will feel no connection, right? So in that way, the connection is not based on physical proximity. Definitely, physical proximity can be a real boost, and I'm not saying we shouldn't want that and get it, but we can't only be dependent on it. Stay in the movement, that's what Prabhupada meant. If you stay in the movement, then, Mahap then Mahaprabhu can use you. And so he says, I have plans. I have plans for all of you. I just need someone willing to do it. Who's willing? Raise your hand. We need, we need to clean the temple. Raise your hand if you're willing, okay? So if you're willing here, you get a broom and you get a dust pan. A dust, dust pan. You get a broom and a dust pan. So that's your empowerment, the broom and the dustpan. And it will give you a ladu if you do it. So something like that. Now, the the thing the, the thing is, if you understand this, it will help you overcome this I'm hopeless, useless thing, because you'll realize that that I'm hopeless, useless um, is actually empowering, not disempowering. And so if you if you think I'm hopeless and useless in a disempowering way, that's completely tamasic. It has nothing to do with Krishna consciousness. But if you think I'm hopeless and useless in an empowering way, in other words, I I'm hopeless and useless is an is a is a confession that I'm not going to act on false ego. Like I don't think I'm great. I don't think I'm special. But I'm going to allow Krishna to help me. So that's free from false ego, but when I say I'm hopeless, useless, that's full false ego if it disempowers me. Does that make sense to you? I'm hopeless and useless. That's why I think, I think that's my identity and therefore I act like I'm hopeless and useless. But if it's free from false ego, I'm hopeless and useless means I don't think I'm the doer. I think Krishna's the doer, and I'm willing to be empowered by Krishna, and I'm willing to try to spread Krishna consciousness far and wide, as if I'm full of ego, but I have I don't have the ego that it's me who's doing it. I have the ego that it's that it's Krishna who's doing it, and he'll empower me. So if you ever feel hopeless and useless and it discourages you, then you can understand that is com that is very Thomasic. It's coming from the mode of ignorance. It's not a spiritual realization. It's just a psychological problem. But if you feel hopeless and useless and that empowers you, Krishna, please help me. You know, I can't do this without you. And you're to totally dependent on him. That's a spiritual realization. And so... How unfortunate is it if we don't get the spiritual realization, but only get the, the tamagun effect of it? That's really unfortunate. The same words come out of our mouth, but the mentality is completely different. So the conclusion of, uh, or the way that we will not feel separation from Guru is, that we make his desire our desire. Now, there's one more point, caveat, uh, a disclaimer that has to be made. You remember when Prabhupada got the instruction from his spiritual master, it was, he was 1922, I believe, or 23. Could be 1922. That meant Prabhupada was 26 years old. Or maybe it was earlier, I can't remember. Does anyone know? Maybe it was when Prabhupada was 23 years old. Maybe it wasn't 1920, it might have been 1918 or something. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was 1918 when Prabhupada was 22. So Prabhupada got the instruction when he was 22. Don't you think it's amazing that if it was 1922, then 43 years later, 
that instruction was burning within him still. Yeah. So now a lot of us will say, okay, you know, I have the instruction of my guru, but I can't execute it. So let's use Prabhupada's example. There's two examples. One, he fully executed it 43 years later because circumstantially he couldn't do it before that. But number two, he didn't forget it. And number three, he executed as best he could according to the situation he's in. So you might hear something like, well, I know Prabhupada wants us to open temples or distribute Bhagavatam sets or this or that. But you, you're like married and you have, have children and, and a job and you're extremely busy. So you might feel, well, I'm useless. I can't do anything. So when we say make the words of, you know, make your life, make your desire the words of the spiritual master, then you, you think in my life, in that context, what does that mean? And I'll give you an example. There was a devotee who had a young child, and I believe she was living in Vrindavan. And she, she spoke to Prabhupada and she said, you know, I'm just, it's kind of common, you know, so many devotees are doing so many things and I'm just sitting here taking care of my child. I feel like I'm not doing anything. How can I serve you? Or am, am, I, am I pleasing you by doing this? Or I don't know if she had a child, maybe she did. And Prabhupada said, are you reading my books? And she said, yes, every day I'm reading your books. And Prabhupada said, then you're pleasing me. So in her situation, just being a mother and whatever free time she had, she was reading Prabhupada's books. So she made that her desire, the desire to, the desire to, uh, serve Prabhupada in that way by reading his book. So it's so so Prabhupada shows that example also that he had limit some limitations of what he could do to serve his spiritual master. But that desire to spread Krishna consciousness around the world, which was the ultimate desire of his spiritual master, was never lost. So I don't want to depress you and think, oh and you all think, well I'm not really really fulfilling the desire of Prabhupada or fulfilling the desire of my guru. But there's so many desires, and so many instructions. And really being with your guru or feeling his presence is, is like when you're in the world and you're seeing, seeing the world and you think, oh, my Guru Maharaj or Srila Prabhupada, he said, we should see it like this. Now you feel, oh, I'm with my guru because, I, because my eyes are his eyes. They're not my eyes. His desires, my desire, his eyes are my eyes, his ears are my ears, like that. I see, I hear, I look at the world through his lens. Just like nowadays, there's so many people on the internet with so many points of view. So whose point of view do we ascribe to? Well, according to our cultural and political conditioning, we may ascribe to certain views that are not really necessarily Christian conscious or views that Prabhupada ascribed to. So as Disciples, we want to ascribe to views that Prabhupada describes. We want to see it, see through his lens. So that's that's what it means being one with the desire of the guru. So, and then and then as we said, when you're like that, you always feel his presence because I'm seeing. Oh yeah, I'm seeing this. Guru Maharaj said this about this situation. Now I feel connected. Right. Have any of you studied Shakespeare? Did you any of you study Shakespeare in school? And or um, like when I was young, we had to read read Homer, who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. Or you may study. Um, oh, yeah, I think Shakespeare is pretty must be popular in India. I mean, popular all over the world. I think he failed his English class, so he decided to make up his own words or something. Um, anyway, if you read a great author who who's, who speaks things that have improved your life or affected you deeply, you feel very connected, even though that author lived 500 years ago. 
or uh, Shakespeare. When did Shakespeare live? Anybody know? Renaissance time or 1600s, 17, 15, 15, 16. Something like that. So anyway, five, six hundred years ago. But if you study him and you and you resonate with him, you you'll feel very connected to him. As you will to any author you've never met or who's no longer alive and you can't met. 1564. Wow, look at that. How did I know that? Super soul. Super soul. I didn't study Shakespeare in university. Super soul revealed that. It's the time of Mahaprabhu, the Renaissance. So we're in some situation and then we think, oh, what did Prabhupada say about this? What did my spiritual master say about this? And we try to see the situation in that way and then naturally you feel connected. What would my guru, you know, you see something. What would my guru Maharaj say about this? Like we have a, a little joke, which I make uh, with to my disciples. Sometimes when I'm leaving, uh, they say any instruction, last instruction, and I say, don't do anything I wouldn't do. And that's kind of like what a father would tell his children, you know, when they go off to college or they're going out to a party or, you know, going out to some situation where they could perhaps do something wrong. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. You know, so you can extend that, you know, see, see everything the way I would see it. Speak everything the way I would speak it. And so naturally, you know, if we're very close to Prabhupada. Sometimes when we go on morning walks occasionally, I'll re I will relate to devotees something that I heard on a morning walk from Prabhupada. So that immediately just puts me right there. Like, like it's just like I'm there with Prabhupada. So that um, that's available to all of us. And so, you know, if we, if we become too dependent on the personal association of the guru, then we may not be able to access the real association, which is the ways we're discussing now. So I'm going to look at the chat to see if there's any questions or comments. Hare Krishna. Um, stay means stay in the movement or keep following the process and spread Krishna consciousness. As some devotees leave Iskand, but keep following Prabhupada. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I'll give you I'll give you the context. At this point, there was no other movement to leave to when Prabhupada said this. It was 1972. So when he said stay, he meant stay in ISKCON because that was the only Gaudiya Vaishnava movement, right? Now, if you want to interpolate or interpret this statement in a modern context, you could expand it and say stay in Krishna consciousness. You could expand the words Krishna consciousness movement to include all bona fide Gaudiya Vaishnav lineages and movements. That would be a, that would be more, a more proper, at least philosophical understanding. Um, if um, um, otherwise, otherwise we'd be saying if you're not in ISKCON, you can't spread Krishna consciousness. Well, that's not true. Of course you can. Anybody can do it anywhere whether you're within the structure or, you know, I mean, how do you know you're even in ISKCON? I mean, you, you, you have a guru who's in ISKCON and you go to ISKCON temples, but, but if you, you, what if you didn't have a guru? And what if you didn't go to ISKCON temples? Would that mean you're not in ISKCON? Maybe not. So, there, you know, there's a big gray area between what is ISKCON and what isn't. But one time Prabhupada said, wherever two devotees are hearing and chanting, that is ISKCON. But I think Prabhupada meant, Prabhupada meant that that conceptually is where 
Krishna consciousness exists when any two devotees hear and chant together. That's the Hare Krishna movement. And so the Hare Krishna movement can, can come in many sizes and shapes and varieties. But from an in, if I were to answer that from a putting on the hat of an institutional leader, then I would say stay and work in ISKCON, within ISKCON because that's what Prabhupada wanted. And only only leave it if you cannot possibly exist within it, if you cannot thrive within it. If you cannot spread Krishna, if the only way you can exist and thrive and be true to your own consciousness is to do it outside, yeah, of course. We we're not going to send you to hell for that, but general instruction Prabhupada gave us was to stay within and, and work together. So that's what we try to do. But you know, if we think those statements of Prabhupada mean only in ISKCON, then we'll condemn everyone who leaves. And some people who leave may be very successful at preaching, and certainly Prabhupada appreciates that. He would rather they be in ISKCON, but it's not that he doesn't appreciate their efforts. And it's not that if someone's outside of ISKCON, it's not that they always will not do things the way Prabhupada wanted them. It's not, we can't make that assumption that they're doing things the way Prabhupada doesn't want. And because we're in ISKCON, we can't make the assumption, assumption everything we do is the way Prabhupada wanted. Although in theory, those two ideas sound good, but in reality, they're not true, necessarily anyway. Is that okay, Hari Bhakti? Oh, you want to ask something more about it? It's okay for now. I, well, well, let me say, I, I want to say something about this. It's quite important, uh, and I was thinking about it lately. If, if we make propaganda against devotees or other Gaudiya movements outside of ISKCON, for whatever reason, I mean, sometimes in the past, some devotees have been coerced to leave ISKCON and join those mm -hmm. movements. So that was not a savory experience. But let's make the assumption that generally that doesn't happen. I don't think it's happening anymore. So maybe we might say, well, outside in, of ISKCON and this movement, they're preaching this doctrine, which uh, doesn't seem to be aligned with Prabhupada or whatever. And so uh, that may be true. It may be our subjective opinion. But um, it's not generally something we need to dwell on unless those people are are alluring devotees with some philosophy that we feel is not completely in line with Prabhupada or confusing devotees with some philosophy that's not in line with Prabhupada. But if that's not the case, then it's better we just respect them. Because I've seen devotees over the years, maybe it's not so bad now, but I've seen devotees over the years make um, enormous offenses uh, to leaders of other Gaudiya movements. And those offenses were uncalled for and un, uh, damaging both to ISKCON and the individual. So that's something we need to be cautious about and something that is not uncommon. There are many faults in ISKCON, there are many faults in all organizations. So whenever we focus on the faults of an organization, it's unless we're in a managerial position or unless, unless we see that it's detrimental to the welfare of devotees, it usually causes damage to our own selves. So we need to be a little cautious and careful. Okay, is that all right? That for now, anyway, something to think about. Sometimes my answers are like, think about that for now and plant that seed and see how it grows. Kind of kind of just gives you a direction to, to contemplate. So Kirti says, what if some devotees have so much mental disturbance that other devotees suffer because of them in the temple? Yeah. That devotee keeps creating problems but still wants to stay in the temple and chanting, even initiated but helpless. And authority in temple decides, send that devotee out of the temple after giving so many chances. Is this the correct way? Will Prabhupada be pleased by authority decision? 
you know, every case is individual. But certainly Prabhupada didn't like it if some devotee was upsetting everybody else. And sometimes he would remove someone who was doing that. And if a person is incorrigible and continues, continually upsets devotees, probably they have some mental problem and they need help. And they're probably not willing to get help. Otherwise, they probably would have been acting in a better way if they had gotten help. And so they probably don't think they need help. And they probably think everyone is, on, is um, unfairly dealing with them. So that's one common scenario. Another common scenario is not what you described is that the person um, is creating a problem, but they try to rectify it and they understand it. And another problem is the person is just innocently, like they're innocently creating problems. They're not bad people, they're just, they have some limitation and it's causing a problem. And so if devotees feel compassion for that person and understand that they have some limitations which causes them to act in ways which is upsetting and devotees can accept that, then um, it may not be a problem because they just understand, oh, that person acts this way because of X, Y, and Z. We understand it, we're okay. So I would say yes, that if it's creating a big disturbance amongst other devotees, it is a cause definitely for consideration to allow that person to come because sometimes you have to sacrifice one person for the welfare of the temple. So because I don't know the person's situation, that's the best I can see. We have a question from the last Wednesday, okay. Hmm. I'm going to ask Nishta Bhakti's question first because it's on the topic. How empty, how to empty the suitcase or not to have personal material desire? Well, I wish it were as easy as one answer. But what I'm hoping is that from this lecture, we understand the empowerment process and we understand from Prabhupada's example what an ideal, ideal disciple is. You know, sometimes someone says, I want to be a disciple. And I think, you know, if you're a disciple, that means you're you're making the desire of your guru most important thing in your life. That's a big that's a big step to take, isn't it? Like, like a lot of times we're inspired by our spiritual master and we say, I want to be your disciple. And it's quite natural when you're inspired by someone and you, and you, you hear them and it's helping you. you. You want to hear more and you want to serve. But I think there's another aspect we always don't consider in that emotional high when we're connecting with our guru is that, well, really to be a disciple means to make your guru's desire more important than your own. So then the question is, do you really want to do that? I mean, are you ready for that? Yeah, because think about it. That's kind of a big thing, isn't it? And some devotees will say, yes, yes, I want to do that. And some other devotees might say, oh, I never thought of that. But that's that's what it means to be a disciple. And so how much of my desire can I give up for their desire? It may be a gradual process, but at least we should understand that's the direction we're heading. And so I think a lot of this is going to come, Nishta Bhakti, through our advancement. But at the same time, it's also going to come through knowledge. Like when you do service, when you make sacrifice, when you give up something to help another devotee you will always feel a greater pleasure than when you just try to do something to satisfy yourself. So those experiences, or when you try to please your guru and you feel this great bliss that you could never get by just trying to please yourself. So those experiences, as you build on those experiences, it becomes easier and easier to let go of self-interest because 
you realize through experience that, that, that my greatest bliss is when I am not thinking about myself. And if you study psychology at all, you'll find that extreme self-centeredness is always the con generally, if not always, the consequence of a psychological disorder. It's always about me. Narcissistic behavior, it's always about me. Psychopathic, sociopathic behaviors, even low self-esteem, um, neurosis, all these things, it's always about um, how I feel. You know, this is a key ingredient of narcissism. Like It's all about how I feel. It's not about how you feel. You can feel miserable by what I've, I've done, that I don't care, and I or may not even notice, or if I'm a sociopath, I can't even feel it. I think narcissistic people also can't feel it. I can't feel your pain. All I can feel is my pain. So um, we were, we want to experience, or we do experience the pleasure of, that comes through service to Guru and Krishna and the other Vaishnavas. And by experiencing that over and over again, it becomes easier and easier and, and more desirable to give up our own personal desire for the service of Guru. Another thought also, which is, I think, obvious, but very powerful. How many lifetimes have we tried to fulfill our desires? And right now, we're not satisfied after millions of lifetimes trying to satisfy our desires. But if we can satisfy the desire of Guru and Krishna, wow, there's ecstasy in that. And we understand that intellectually, and it's good to meditate on that. Because as we meditate on it, and as we do it, it's going to become easier and easier to set our desires aside and put Krishna's desires, Guru's desires in the front. Now, as you know, and I've talked about this, as you know, you have a body. You probably noticed. Have you noticed you have a body? Yeah, you probably notice, right? Especially when you get hungry, you really notice. You notice it even more when you're tired, right? The body has desires, but the desires of the body are different, can be much different than the desires of the heart. So the desires of the heart, I want. I want fame, I want prestige, I want success, I want wealth, I want recognition. These are the desires of the heart. The desires of the body is basically eating, meeting, eating, meeting, because I go to so many meetings. And, I stopped mating and I replaced it with meeting. So it's either eating, meeting, eating, sleeping, mating, defending, or eating, sleeping, meeting, defending. For the old devotees, it's eating, sleeping, meeting, and defending. So as you notice, your body gets tired periodically, it gets hungry periodically. And sometimes we like to argue, we like to defend our turf, right? It's false ego defends itself. That's the defending principle. We're worried about our security, defending money or other forms of security, defending. And sexual desire, it's embodied biologically within the body, especially the bodies of younger people. The desires are stronger because those are the years that they're meant to have children. And so when we say, only Krishna's desire, only Guru's desire, not my desire. You know, we, we have to balance this and we have to just edify this or clarify this, that I do have other needs and, and maybe we don't want to call them desires, we call them needs. So I have other needs that will need to be fulfilled so that I can make Guru's desire my desire. So if I don't eat, I don't sleep, I'm not in the proper ashram, I don't have the proper varna, then the body's not happy. So, so I think I think for us, an important point here is let us call those needs rather than desires. Because when we call them needs, we can say, oh, these are functional things that I need to be balanced and grounded in Krishna consciousness. Then it then it makes sense, doesn't it? And then we can say, I will make my desire Krishna's desire. And you might say, well. Krishna wants me to give up eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. Not exactly. He wants you to eat, sleep, mate, and defend only as much as you require. Not more, not less. That's what he wants. 
So we have to understand that. The but you know, you know how the body is. Did you ever like get hungry and wish you weren't hungry, or you get tired and it's not a good time to be tired? You have something to do, and it's like I wish I wasn't tired, but the body's going tired. Your eyelids are closing. Your mind is shutting down. Right. The other day I was chanting, I got up early in the morning and I was chanting Japa. And then like, I don't know how long I was asleep. I had no idea I fell asleep. I was just chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. The next thing I knew, I was like, and, I, and you know, it must have been at least 20 minutes or more. Because I got up early and I didn't get enough rest. So that's what happens. You know, the body just goes to sleep when it's tired. You, know, you don't even know it. You know, I mean... But maybe that's not true for everyone, but you know, when my body's tired, I can just be sitting there reading. And you know, it's six in the morning, next thing I know it's 6:30, and I'm still on the same line. And I didn't even know I fell asleep. So um now if if we're more Krishna conscious, we can push through that with the energy of our devotion and so on and so forth. But we have to deal with the level of Krishna, the realities of the level of Krishna consciousness we're on. So, you know, we can't sleep three hours and, or four hours unless we have a mind that is so inspired in devotional service that it can push the body beyond, beyond its own fatigue and excite it and so forth. So that we can call those needs. So I want to make all my desires one. Guru Mukha Padma Bhakya, that's what it means. Chitite Kariya. Aikya means one. I want to make all my desires one, but I have needs to fulfill. And if I fulfill those needs, then I can make my desires one. So we want to distinguish those two things. So I hope that helps. Um, then we'll go to the next question. And if there's time for Katie's question. Katie's question is, it's really, it's a general question. It could be answered in a thousand different ways depending on the situation. Prabhupada emptied his plate, at the same time used his intelligence and management skills to full extent to fulfill his Guru Dave's desire. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but you could also say uh, Krishna gave him so much intelligence and management skill beyond his ordinary management skills. And intelligence. Because Prabhupada says that a lot. You know, Prabhupada always says, Krishna is within you, he'll give you intelligence, he'll guide you. So that that's there. And then um taking what you said, Hari Bhakti, let's just take that as a starting point. There's what's that a word for it? That starting point, you know. There's some word I can't remember. Good luck. What? Gridlock. Gridlock. Gridlock? No. Um, Gridlock. Can you type it in? Uh, like, like all our, our, all of our starting points are different, right? So you're starting here. I'm starting here. Someone's starting here. Someone's starting there. Um, baseline, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so your baseline is different than my baseline, different than someone else's baseline. But from that point, the empowerment process takes you. Right? So it's obviously you're not going to give up your baseline abilities, but those are baseline abilities will have some limitation. That and then and then you can also say, well, maybe your baseline ability is lower, so Krishna gives you more more guidance, more intelligence, because you need more. So that that's that that's also a way of looking at it. Hmm. I think maybe inherent in that your question is, well, if I say I'm helpless, I don't have anything. You know, we look at Prabhupada and say, no, but he had so much. How could he say that? Because he's saying that I didn't have enough to spread Krishna consciousness. I had so much, maybe I could have been a wealthy businessman. But to spread Krishna consciousness around the world, those, those material abilities aren't going to work. So I have intelligence. I have, what did you say, intelligence and what else? 
um, the management skills. I have intelligent management skills. But the way to look at that is that that's not enough to spread Krishna consciousness around the world. You can't just do it by man material management and intelligence. Right? If you're going to, and Prabhupada said that, and that 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 was the criticism of his god brothers. Oh, he's just a good businessman. And Prabhupada's answer was that you can't spread Krishna consciousness without being empowered. Krishna Shakti Vina Nahi Tara Pravarjana. He quoted that verse. Without Krishna, so he's saying they're thinking it's material ability, but it's spiritual ability. So naturally they combine, but the material ability alone is insufficient to spread a spiritual movement because you also have to be pure, right? You have to be exempt. You have to have so many qualities. And Krishna has to give you proper intelligence of how to do things and how to share things. So, oh, yeah. That's the right answer. The last thing I said is, the other things I said are okay, but the last thing I said is the actual direct hit the target answer. Um, so we'll go to Katie's question while we're waiting for Gormani. Um, how to apply the wife as the head? Because we talked about the wife as the head before. Uh, wife as the head. Um, what should and shouldn't be done? That's a discussion you would, wife and husband would have. It's not like, let's get out a book and this is what it says. But what if it says in the book, that this is how it should be done, and it doesn't work for you, then what's the point of following the book? So sometimes we'll find things that in our situation won't exactly work because of the differences. And so we have to make adjustments. The goal is to respect one another and become Krishna conscious. So if that's the goal, and we make some adjustment to achieve that goal, that's not a problem. As long as what adjustments we're making are not, we're not committing anything sinful. And this is where some devotees get hung up on this. They said, no, this is the principle. You're breaking the principle. But then it's like that saying, the, the operation was a success and the patient died. So it's like, what's the point? You know, you did it everything properly and you got divorced. But we followed all the principles. Yeah, you followed them right into divorce. But what if you adjusted and those principles weren't applying to you exactly and you adjusted the principles that work for you specifically? and you stay together in Krishna consciousness, wouldn't that be better than getting divorced? But at least we follow the principles, you know? And the surgeon kills the patient. Well, at least I followed the handbook. Oh, thanks a lot. You just killed my father. But I followed the handbook. Well, if you didn't follow the handbook, you think you could have saved him? Yeah, probably, but I followed the handbook. You know, you'd think this doctor should be sued and fired, right? So we don't want to do that. I think Gormani may be having a hard time getting on, do they? And now yeah. she's coming. Now she's coming on. Yeah. 